How's it going, YouTube? This is Skull, and today I want to look at a retrospective of the first calendar year of the Nintendo Switch. The Switch was released worldwide this year on March 3, and honestly, it's hard to believe it's not been a year yet since it came out. We've had dozens of quality titles released for it, including a whopping 10 titles that Nintendo either published themselves or had a huge part in developing. To the best of my research, no other console in history had this much support year one, and while I'm a tiny bit worried that this will be hard to keep up in the upcoming years, and thus leave the Switch front-loaded without a long-term plan, I think it's safe to say the Switch has left a mark on the world of gaming big enough to let people know Nintendo is back, and it's here to stay for a while. The Switch was actually the first console I ever got day one. The closest I had come before this was the Wii U, which I got around the time Super Smash Bros. came out for that thing, a full two years after launch. The Wii U never really got the support most of us wished it would, and as a result, while I got to play a few quality titles on it, when all was said and done, it was not as fulfilling of a gaming console as I had originally hoped when I bought it. The Switch, on the other hand, has put out more titles that I've sat down, played, and enjoyed in a mere 10 months than the Wii U did in 5 years. That's pretty amazing to think about, isn't it? I mean, a year and a half ago, Star Fox Zero was out and Paper Mario Color Splash was on the way. And almost all the articles I read online about Nintendo were either about their upcoming NX console or opinion pieces speculating whether Nintendo would be better off going the way of Sega and become a third-party publisher instead of a console manufacturer. Regardless, here we are at the end of 2017, and there are over 90 games physically released on the Nintendo Switch, with several dozen more released on the eShop. Already, the Switch has almost half of the Wii U library, and one of my goals from the get-go was to build a complete Nintendo Switch physical game library. Around October, I had to start backing off from buying every single game day one, as there were just too many coming out at once. It went from 4 or 5 a month to 4 or 5 a week meaning I've had to start picking and choosing which games to get. That being said, I've managed to get most of the big hitters this year, and I make it a point to play all my games at least a little bit. The biggest games I don't have yet are L.A. Noir and Doom, both of which I really want to play, but unfortunately just haven't had the time to get yet. From what my friends have told me, though, they are great games and would probably get a place on this list if I had the chance to play them. However, in an effort to remain as objective as possible, I am limiting this list to two major factors. First, as this is obviously my list, I am only including games this year that I have played. As I said, that is the majority of games, but it means I have to leave off games like L.A. Noir and Doom. Second, this list only applies to physical releases. There are some amazing eShop-only titles, my favorite of which is Shantae Half Genie Hero, by the way, go check it out if you haven't already. But since I generally don't play those, I feel it's only best to limit myself to physical releases. As is usual with these kinds of videos, this is my list, and I am extremely biased. I am a Nintendo fan through and through, and while there certainly are a lot of amazing games that aren't on the list this year, please remember this is just my top 9 picks, and if you have entirely different top 9 picks, that's perfectly fine. In fact, I'd love to hear what your top games were this year in the comments. With that out of the way, I think you've had enough of hearing my prologue, let's get to it! My Top 9 Nintendo Switch Games of 2017. Why 9? Because I couldn't be bothered to pick a 10th. Number 9, 1-2 Switch. I'm sure this might come as a surprise to most of you. And before you dislike the video, leave a comment saying you don't know what you're talking about and click to another tab, hear me out. Honestly, I got this game months after it came out. I paid $37 for it on eBay, and even that I feel was overpriced. I still think that. This game is little more than a tech demo for the Switch, and like most people, I agree it should have been a pack and title. That being said, wow, what a tech demo it is. 1-2 Switch is actually a series of minigames, all of which are party games that require you to play with someone else. You can do all kinds of things, like milk a cow and pretend to have an Old West duel with your Joy-Con controllers. As far as party games go, this actually isn't that bad, and with the Switch being portable, it's nice to take it with you to a friend's house, take out the Joy-Cons, and see who can shave their face faster. But what really blew my mind was the use of the Joy-Con controller's HD rumble feature. This is probably most noticeable in the minigame involving miniature balls. You're supposed to hold the Joy-Con horizontally, roll it around, and feel small ball bearings inside the Joy-Con, and you have to guess how many are in there. It really is something you have to experience firsthand to understand, but the first time I played that minigame, my mind was blown. I really did feel like there were small ball bearings inside that Joy-Con. I mean, I don't think I ever correctly guessed how many were in there, but it wasn't the typical rumble feature in regular controllers. It felt amazing, and it really showed off what the Joy-Cons are capable of. Will we ever see something like this again in the future? 
Probably not. Is 1-2 Switch worth the $50 asking price? Absolutely not. But for what it is, it has some fun mini games and does an outstanding job of showing off the system's capabilities. I think even if you don't buy it, you should at least find an opportunity to try it out. You might be surprised how fun and even addicting it can be. Number 8. Sonic Forces It's difficult to include this one, honestly, for one reason. This is a 100% exact port to the Xbox, PlayStation, and PC versions. Except this runs at 30 frames per second instead of 60, but that doesn't count. Why should I include this game on here when I could just as easily include a game that is a Switch exclusive instead? The answer is because for me and a lot of my friends, the Switch was the only choice for getting Sonic Forces. I don't mean to say we don't own the other consoles, in my case I own all of them. What I mean is that it's a no-brainer to get it on the Switch, especially since there's absolutely no difference between this and the other console versions. In a way, that automatically gives this game a spot on the list, as it helps me push one of the biggest reasons to get a Switch in the first place. The game is exactly the same on the other consoles, but the Switch version you can take on the go. When I go to New York in February, I won't have to be stuck with just my old 3DS games. I can take my Switch with me and experience Sonic Forces in all its glory, whereas if I had gotten the PS4 version, I'd have to leave that at home. I think I read somewhere that over half of Sonic Forces sales were on the Switch version, no doubt thanks to that exact mentality, meaning that every single copy sold to all the other consoles combined still didn't match up to the amount sold on the Switch. And this is great! It tells publishers not to prioritize the PS4 and Xbox One, then make a Switch port a few months or even years down the line. With Sonic Forces' success on the Switch, hopefully developers will see that and start making more day one ports of big games on the Switch. I mean, all that is a whole different conversation for another time, but that's my reason for including Sonic Forces on this list instead of, say, FIFA 18. With that out of the way, let's talk about the game. Full disclosure, the very first Sonic game I ever personally played was Sonic Advance 3 for the Game Boy Advance. I was born a tad too late to witness the console wars in the early 90s, and by the time I was old enough to pick and choose what games I wanted to play, Sonic was already beginning to appear on other consoles. I had never played a 3D Sonic game before Sonic Forces, not because I was avoiding them, but because they just never seemed to show up on my radar. Of course, everyone knows Sonic 06 and how infamous that game is, but overall from what I've seen, 3D Sonic games are still enjoyable on their own. They're not as fun as the 2D games, of course, but for what they are, it's fun to sit down for a few minutes and play some 3D Sonic. Earlier this year, of course, Sonic Mania came out, and I played that game a lot on the Switch. In the time since I started collecting games last year, I had gotten and played through Sonic 1 and 2 for the Genesis, and I can say without hesitation that Sonic Mania met those games, and in some ways even surpassed them in terms of quality gameplay. It was fun to play. Sonic Forces, on the other hand, has nothing I can compare. It is my first 3D Sonic game. And for that, honestly, it's not bad. I mean, it is number 8 on my list here. I find the story pretty average, and sometimes the stages juggle between too easy and too hard, sometimes even within the same stage, but the rest of it is amazing. The character creator is very fun, and I've spent hours, and I mean hours, changing the character designs all around and coming up with fun designs. The controls are very responsive, and in most cases, when I die, I feel it is my fault instead of the game being unfair. The dialogue is well scripted, and the voice actors do a great job delivering their lines. This feels like a living, breathing universe, and that's always something I admire when a game can pull that off. All that aside, though, the game is admittedly fairly average. There's nothing particularly memorable about it except for the character creator, and about the best thing I can say about it when compared to other 3D Sonic games is, at least it's better than Sonic 06. I probably won't play this game much after I beat it the first time, but in terms of Switch games this year, this is definitely one I recommend picking up. Number 7. ARMS This year, Nintendo created another brand new IP, and like they're so good at, they've taken a genre of gaming and added their own unique spin on it. In this case, ARMS is a fighting game, but with a focus on, well, ARMS. ARMS draws a lot of comparisons to Splatoon on the Wii U before it. Both games introduced a new IP into the mix, both feature kid-friendly takes on their respective genres, and both utilize their console's extra hardware with great results. Whereas Splatoon used the Wii U's gamepad better than any other game on that system, ARMS here uses the Joy-Con controllers to let you physically control your character in real life. I'll admit, I spent a few hours on this before I got used to it, and even now, I much prefer using traditional stick controls instead of motion controls, but you've got to admit, they work pretty well. Not since the Wii era have we seen motion controls work this well, and as someone who really likes the Wii, it's a welcome change. 
That being said, it's also nice to know you can turn off motion controls altogether in this game, as opposed to some other games made this year, which, no matter how good, rely on motion controls in some way, no matter how much you want to turn them off. Of course, Nintendo has made fighting games in the past, both 2D and 3D. Heck, Super Smash Bros. is one of the most famous fighting games of all time, and that was produced by Nintendo. ARMS is a 3D fighter, which I always seem to struggle with more than 2D fighters, but the magic of the game is that it never feels like a 3D fighter. It feels like a 2D fighter in a 3D environment along the lines of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out for the original NES. The whole appeal of the game is to go online and fight other real-life people. You can also play with your friends and local multiplayer. Personally, I haven't played this game all that much. Whenever I sit down and feel like turning on my Switch, other games always seem more appealing to me. But when I do pick ARMS, I have a great fun time, even if I don't know what I'm doing for most of it. Number 6. Pokémon Tournament Deluxe It's Pokémon Tournament but Deluxe. This is one of the many enhanced Wii U ports that we received this year on the Switch, but it truly does earn the Deluxe in its title. My first exposure to Pokémon Tournament was at the 2015 Pokémon World Championships. That was when they announced the game was coming to the Wii U and had a playable demo available for all attendees to try out. I played it a few times. I won some, I lost some, and I never really figured out what I was doing. Last year, Pokémon Tournament released on the Wii U. I got it day one, played it all day, but then basically stopped after that. I really wanted to like it, but there was just something about it that prevented me from getting into it. I guess I'm just not a fan of fighting games, even though I'm a mega fan of Pokémon. This year, Pokémon Tournament Deluxe released. Once again, I got it day one, and even though the mechanics are the same as before, the game adds a lot that makes it worth the money. The portability itself is a plus, to be sure, but even so, if you have the Wii U version, you just might want to consider trading it in to help fund this upgrade. That being said, there's honestly not much to say about this game. It adds several new Pokémon to the character roster, plenty of new support Pokémon, and even a few new stages. It's still difficult for me to get into this game for any long period of time, but when I sit down and play with my friends, there's a lot of fun to be had. I recommend you get this game if you have friends who play it as well, and that you play together. Number 5. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Holy cow! I was looking forward to this game ever since it was first revealed earlier this year. I've never played the first Xenoblade Chronicles or Xenoblade X on the Wii U, so this was my first exposure to the franchise, and boy was it a great introduction. The E3 footage alone sold me on the game. The graphics and scope of the game instantly look impressive, especially on the Switch. The battle mechanics looked like something I would like, and the story looked promising as well. So for most of this year, I was super excited to get this game, knowing it would be good. But even so, when I finally got it, I didn't expect it to be this good. The game is a full-blown JRPG, and as such looks and feels like an anime. There are plenty of instances while playing through the game that I set down the controller, sat back, and watched some pretty impressive cutscenes that helped push the story along. It was an epic story, and you want to keep playing the game for hours on end in order to see what happens next. It's a huge story, with lots of characters, each of whom has a unique personality and is important to the plot. For that alone, I would say this game is worth the buy. But there's a lot more to Xenoblade Chronicles 2 than the plot. This game has a massive open world for you to explore. You can engage in battles with monsters, you can go salvaging for treasure, and take on numerous side quests that dot the entire game. You can easily put off the main story as long as you want and enjoy living in this amazing, expansive world. The developers made sure that there's always something to do, and even if you're not completing a quest, you can stand out in an open field and just pan the camera around, taking in the scenery. The game always has stuff going on in the background, and more than once I found myself looking off into the distance, in awe of what the game and the Switch is capable of showing off. Of course, the game has its flaws, like almost any game. The voice acting in English is spotty, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, even among the same character saying two sentences back to back. The pre-rendered cutscenes are amazing, but it makes the in-engine cutscenes look cheap and outdated by comparison, and sometimes it's a bit distracting to see a character talk with the lip syncing out of whack and their face not changing expressions for several minutes on end. Sometimes during battle, it's obvious that you're going to lose, and it's a little difficult to run away from the battle before you die, but at the same time, that also helps you gain the knowledge in playing the game of picking your battles, which is important when you're off grinding before taking on a major quest. All that being said, as I said before, this is my first Xenoblade game, so I don't know how it stacks up with either the original Chronicles or X. 
but on its own, this is easily a great addition to my Switch library, and I highly recommend you get it. I mean, it did make the top 5 of 2017 on my list. Number 4. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Once again, it's Mario Kart 8, but Deluxe. The original Mario Kart 8 is the game that persuaded me to buy a Wii U. It was the first game I saw that I felt was a system seller. And it was my only game on the Wii U for a few months, so I had a lot of time to play it. And I loved it from the beginning. The graphics are nothing short of beautiful, the characters and carts are all well balanced, and the items create all sorts of fun times. It's the kind of game you can play either alone, or in a room with friends, or online with strangers, and no matter how good or bad you're doing, you're having a lot of fun. There aren't many games that can say that. So when they first announced Mario Kart 8 Deluxe would be coming out on the Switch, I'll admit, at first I was skeptical about picking it up. I already had Mario Kart 8 along with both of its DLCs, and the deluxe version simply didn't feel like it was that important of a buy. However, I bit the bullet and got the game, and I can say without hesitation, it was worth it. This is single-handedly the best Mario Kart video game made to this day. At its core, yes, it is still Mario Kart 8. 90% of it is a carbon copy of the Wii U version, but it's that extra 10% that makes it a must-buy, even if you already owned it the first time. The battle modes alone make it a lot more fun, but there's also new characters, the DLC stages included for free, double items for double the intensity, and a whole lot more. Honestly, there isn't much I can say that hasn't already been said. Any issues I had with this game back when I had it on the Wii U are completely absent from this version, making it the definitive Mario Kart that can be played right now. Do yourself a favor, get this game. Number 3. Splatoon 2. In my opinion, Splatoon was the single best game on the Wii U, and remains one of the only games to remain a Wii U exclusive that hasn't been ported to other systems. Ever since the first game's announcement at E3 2014, I was hooked on the concept. It's a third-person shooter, but instead of going for kills, your objective is to cover up the ground in your ink. This was the first major new IP that Nintendo had created since Pikmin, and I had put more hours into the game on the Wii U than any other game on the system by far. As a guy who had rarely ever played any actual shooters beforehand, it was easy and relieving to jump in and have a lot of fun without having to adapt my playstyle. So when Splatoon 2 was announced for the Switch, as you can imagine, my excitement went through the roof. And upon its release, it easily has become one of my most played games on the system, even outside of when I do private battles with my friends for videos. Splatoon 2 is one of the only games to come out this year that is neither a port of a previous release of a game, nor a new entry in a series. It's a flat-out sequel to Splatoon. I mean, yes, thanks to the constant support the game has received throughout this year from Nintendo, many of the previous stages and weapons from the first game have made their comeback. But this is not a port of Splatoon. It is an entirely new game and it looks absolutely stunning on the Switch. I didn't think it was possible for the colors to pop off the screen any better than they did on the Wii U, but by golly, this game is beautiful. The ink has an almost realistic paint look to it. The stages are all unique and entertaining, and the variety of weapons available to you ensure that no matter what your playstyle, there's something for you here to make sure you have constant fun. The games are nice and short. In Turf War, you shoot ink around and try to cover the turf, like I mentioned. They last three minutes, so it's nice to sit down for a small chunk of time if you're bored and play a few games. Even if you don't do well, you still earn points and level up, slow but sure. And if you do well, you level up a bit faster. The level cap is now 99 stars, so even if you play this game for several hundred hours or more, there's always room for improvement. The rings battles are where the true chaos exists. There are now four thanks to the addition of Clan Blitz, but that one sucks so I won't discuss that. Rainmaker involves teams fighting for a mega weapon and taking it to the enemy base. Tower Control has teams fighting for control of a moving block and taking that to the enemy base. And my favorite is Splat Zones, where you fight for a very specific area of turf. Each of the rank modes lasts for five minutes, or until one team gets a knockout, whichever comes first. Thankfully, Splatoon 2 changed up the formula a bit by giving each mode their own separate rank, so if you are a high rank in tower control, you don't have to worry about losing it because a few teammates decide to screw around in Splat Zones. The major addition to this game that really separates it from the Wii U game is Salmon Run. And oh boy, this is awesome. You and three other people have to work together to collect salmon eggs, which you get from beating all kinds of salmonoid bosses, all the while avoiding their chums and minions. The better you are, the harder it gets, and it makes for an intense experience. 
There is nothing more satisfying than beating a Salmon Run match after you maxed out your rank, and I sorely hope that Salmon Run returns in future games in the Splatoon series. Overall, multiplayer is where the game is at, and the main reason to get the game. 90% of the time, or maybe even more, you'll be playing with people online. It'll be a sad day, many years from now, when the Splatoon 2 servers shut down, and the only way you'll be able to play multiplayer games is by joining together your Switches with other people in real life. Well, that or watching my videos, I guess. If I were to have one complaint, it would be the single player. Like the first game, it's composed of linear stages that act more like a tutorial and demo for each of the kinds of weapons than an actual campaign mode. However, I would rate this one better than the first game just because the final boss is a lot more fun and the story is a bit more intriguing. In case you haven't beat it yet, I'll refrain from showing it here. Overall, Splatoon 2 is a solid buy for the system. If you were to pick just one Switch game that fell under the online multiplayer category, this is the one I recommend to you. I could talk about Splatoon 2 for hours, but there's still two more games to mention. Number 2. Super Mario Odyssey. So I have a confession to make. I've never actually been that big of a Mario fan. I know, I know, you're going to hit the dislike button and leave the video, especially if you're Andre from Game Explain. But before you do, let me assure you, I really, 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 really loved this game. I mean, come on, it's number two on my list. Super Mario Odyssey at its core is a typical Mario game on the same level as Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine. In fact, I was pretty surprised when I realized this was the first game of its kind since Mario Sunshine, and that was on the GameCube. All the Mario games since then have been either linear platformers or 2D side-scrollers. Even the 3D Mario games like Super Mario Galaxy have been fairly linear in their approach and left little room to freely explore the world, instead opting to present several smaller worlds with very specific places you go. In that sense, Super Mario Odyssey could be considered a reboot to the franchise, and in that case, I'd say it has succeeded. The game now uses an open-world concept, again like that seen in Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine but takes it to a whole new level. There are several kingdoms to explore, and each of them is unique. You have big kingdoms, small kingdoms, colorful kingdoms, dull kingdoms, weird kingdoms, realistic kingdoms, and just about everything you can imagine. And all of them have plenty to explore, so there's never a boring moment while playing. The main highlight of this game is the new capture mechanic. Mario throws his hat at enemies and captures them by taking over their bodies. The possibility the game offers as a result is phenomenal. Now you can use moves that you could only dream of in previous games, or use an enemy's particular abilities in order to access hard to reach places. The whole game is designed around the concept of you capturing enemies with Cappy and using them whenever you see fit. It's fun, and dare I say, even ingenious. There are all sorts of collectibles to get. You have the Power Moons, which are scattered throughout the game, and even if you get the bare minimum needed to beat the game itself, there are several hundred more to get afterwards. Like other Mario games, there are coins as well, and in this game, they've done away with the lives mechanic, and now if you die, you just lose a few coins instead, which is a welcome change. Each kingdom also has their own unique kind of coin, which you can collect and exchange in that specific kingdom for things like clothes and even extra power moves. If I were to use one word to describe this game, it would be fun. Every time you turn your camera, there's some kind of collectible to go grab, or some funny looking character to go talk to. The music is catchy, if perhaps a little forgettable, and you always feel like you're in control of Mario. There wasn't a single time I died and felt cheated. Every time I died, I knew it was my own fault, and it was easy to make sure it didn't happen again a second time. The capture mechanic, of course, is super fun, and I am of the opinion it is the single best mechanic to ever be introduced in a Mario game. As far as Mario games go, this is already pretty high up on my list. I mean, here it is as my number two game of all 2017. So what could be left for number one? Well, there's only one game left, and that is... Number one, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Wow. That's the only word I have to properly describe this game. Wow. I mean, where do I begin? What could I possibly say about this game that hasn't already been said? I mean, this one freaking game of the year at the Game Awards. I'd go as far as to say it should win Game of the Decade, or even better. But what exactly makes it the best? What sets it apart from all the other games released this year? Honestly, it's hard to pinpoint just one thing, so I'm going to have to say everything. We had a five-year delay for this game since its initial announcement, mostly due to Miyamoto being Miyamoto and wanting to add things into the game longer after it should have been done, then delaying the game's release to tie in with the launch of the Switch. 
But boy, was the wait worth it. In my whole life, I have a hard time remembering any other game that sucked me into a make-believe world as much as Breath of the Wild has. The closest thing I have is the first two generations of Pokemon, and I first played those over 15 years ago, so it's definitely been a while. Zelda's traditional gameplay has been thrown out the window in favor of a vast open world. As someone who has always struggled with the old linear Zelda gameplay, with dungeons that took hours to complete and secrets that took a walkthrough to find in order to play the basic game, this was a welcome change for me. Probably the best single change any game has done for the series it belongs to. My first time leaving the Shrine of Resurrection, I took a long look at the scenery around me. I knew, based on all the promotion and talk for the game, that virtually every pixel on the screen in that opening shot is an actual place that you can go to. But knowing that and experiencing that are two very, very different things. For the first full month or two after the game came out, I couldn't put it down. This beautiful open world was at my fingertips, urging me, for the first time in my life, not to complete the main story. If I was on my way to a Divine Beast and came across a shrine on the side of the road, I'd easily take a detour to finish the shrine, and as I came out of the shrine, I'd look in the far distance and see something that I'm sure would hold a secret, so I would head in that direction. But before I got there, I'd spot a Bokoblin camp and decide to raid it. After raiding it, I'd see a village in the distance and make my way over there, and before long, I'd forget what I was doing in the first place. I cannot emphasize enough, that's a good thing. Getting lost, both literally and figuratively, in the world of Hyrule continues to be one of my most enjoyable experiences on the Switch. In fact, while I was recording footage for this video, I sat down promising myself it would only be for 15 minutes. It turned into well over an hour, partly because I kept dying to the stupid Lionel, but my point stands. The immersive experience of this game, for all the praise I'm giving it, is just the tip of the iceberg. Breath of the Wild does everything in its power to remind you that you are learning how to survive in a post-apocalyptic world. One of people's biggest complaints of the game is that the weapons are brittle. That is a valid argument, but it never detracted from my experience. If anything, it enhanced it. It forces you to pick and choose which weapons to use in any given situation. And once they break, you almost always feel that moment of panic as you switch to another weapon. Item inventory is always in the back of your mind, just as it would be if you were living in Hyrule for real. And as the game progresses, you get access to more and more powerful weapons. That tree branch that your life depended on at the beginning of the game? Forget it! Now you have the Master Sword itself, and you earned it through all your hard work. One other thing I really love about this game is the story. Now you don't get to see much of the story, and that is a downer, though the latest DLC helps with that a little bit. As I played through the game, I sort of realized something that really hit Breath of the Wild home for me. This isn't Link's story. This isn't your story as a player. This is Zelda's story, and you're simply taking control of Link in the last little bit of it. Your job is to explore Hyrule and beat Ganon, and while it is a great experience, one of the best of my life, it's not the meat and potatoes of the story. As you regain memories from your past, you see more and more snippets of Zelda from a hundred years ago. Once you get all of them and rewatch them in order, you can see Zelda grow as a character within just a few short months. She goes from a stubborn I can handle myself princess to a young girl unsure of herself, and at the end of it all, a grown woman who wields the power of the goddess herself. Again, it's all in snippets, but it's still a great story. I can say without hesitation that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is my favorite game, not only on the Nintendo Switch, and not even only this year overall. This has cracked into my top 5 favorite video games of all time, barely trailing behind the Pokemon games I know and love. This is one of the most important games that will ever be released on a Nintendo console. And if you don't want to give it a try just because it runs at 30 frames per second instead of 60, well, you're truly missing out on something special. There are secrets around every corner. Enemy camps to raid, shrines to complete, memories to find, treasure chests in the sand, side quests to complete, and... Why are there 900 of these things? Hi everyone, this is Skull. If you liked the video, please leave a like and consider subscribing. If you're already subscribed, hit that little bell so you get notifications whenever I upload a new video. That does it for now. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more.